graphene. And this is some work I've done in collaboration with my supervisor, Steve Simon, and a postdoc, Zung Wen, who used to be in Oxford and he's now at, at Brown in the US. Um, and so I just want to start off by um, explaining essentially the, the title of my talk. Um, in particular, what do I mean by hydrodynamic transport? Um, and so typically in, in metals, there's two different types of collisions. On the one hand, we can have um, momentum galaxy collisions. So those are collisions, for example, of electrons with um, phonons or electrons with impurities. And in those collisions, the momentum of the electrons is, is typically not conserved. But then there's a different type of scattering, which is the scattering of electrons amongst themselves, where the total momentum of the electrons is conserved. And the hydrodynamic regime is, is accessed when these momentum conserving collisions are the dominant source of scattering. And this is in contrast to most ordinary metals that we're familiar with, where in fact these momentum relaxing processes tend to, to dominate. So most normal metals are fairly dirty and so typically impurity scattering will dominate over this electron, electron scattering. Um, but in some extremely clean materials, as I'll argue by layer graphene, um, we can actually access this new interesting hydrodynamic regime. And I'll be talking about some um, possible signatures of this in experiments. Um, so just to say a bit more about um, bilayer graphene. So it comes in um, three different flavors. And the one I want to talk about today is this so-called AB stacked bilayer graphene. So when you have bilayer graphene, you stack two monolayers on top of each other. And depending on how you stack them, you can get different, um, different materials. And of course, this twisted bilayer graphene has been attracting a lot of attention recently as well. But today I'm going to be talking about the more sort of vanilla type of bilayer graphene where you just stack them um, in this AB stacked form. And then the other distinction you can make is, um, how the bilayer graphene is, um, is encapsulated. And so typically they have these um, HBN encapsulated samples where um, you stack the, um, the bilayer graphene in between layers of, um, of the substrate or just on top of the substrate. But in fact, more recently, um, people have been able to manufacture these suspended bilayer samples. Um, and they've got a, a couple of advantages, such as you know, the fact that you don't have a substrate means that you, you don't have any um, sort of disorder effect coming from the substrate. And so the experiments that I'm going to reference today were in fact done on these suspended samples. Um, so let me just discuss the, the motivations for this, this project. So as I mentioned before, we were motivated by the suspended bilayer graphene experiments done by Alberto Mupoko's group in Geneva. And the question we were asking is whether these experiments are in the, the hydrodynamic regime. Um, so to answer that question, we need to understand a little bit about what sort of scattering is going on, which scattering mechanisms are important, um, in particular, which momentum conserving and momentum relaxing collisions are going to be relevant. And we also wanted to ask if we could model this system in a simple way. Um, and in fact, I'll show that there's a simple hydrodynamic two fluid model, which accounts for um, a, a good description of the system. And the experimental observables that we'll be thinking about are transport properties such as the electrical connectivity and the thermal connectivity. Um, so the, the Electrical connectivity was measured in, in these experiments that I'm referencing up here. Um, they didn't um, measure the thermal connectivity in those experiments because that's quite a bit more, more difficult than electrical connectivity. Um, but I'm still going to discuss some of the possible signatures that you would see if you measure the thermal connectivity. So just to give an outline of, um, of my talk, I'm going to start by, um, by giving a sort of broad introduction um, to this, this field and discuss some of the, the history that went into electron hydrodynamics. And then in the main part of the talk, I'm going to discuss two, um, two different theoretical approaches 
to describing the system. And the first one is kinetic theory, um, which um, is going to mainly be based on this quantum Boltzmann equation approach. Um, and so in kinetic theory, we're going to deal with a quantity called the distribution function, f lambda of p, which tells you the number of um, electrons of species lambda at a given momentum. And the quantum Boltzmann equation is going to be an evolution equation for this distribution function. And so to think about when, it, when is kinetic theory valid? Well, kinetic theory is going to be valid if we have a quasi-particle description. Um, so in some sense, we want the interactions to be weak. And to make this more precise, um, thinking about the relevant length scales, um, so we're going to have these length scales lambda mc and lambda mr, which are the mean free paths associated with momentum conserving and momentum relaxing collisions. And we want these mean free paths to be much longer than the thermal wavelength of the, the particles. So the thermal wavelength of the particles is essentially the, the Pauli wavelength of um, a particle that has typical energy kBT. And we want um, the mean free path to be much longer than this, um, essentially the size of our quasi-particles. And then the other approach that I'm going to talk about is a more hydrodynamic approach. This is the two fluid model that I mentioned before. And in hydrodynamics, typically we think about the evolution of, um, of conserved quantities. And so in this talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the, the conservation of momentum. And so we'll think about um, the evolution equation for this conserved momentum, which I'm labeling u lambda. So this is sort of the mean velocity of the particles of species lambda. And again, what's the, the validity of, um, of this approach? Well, we want momentum to be, to be conserved. In other words, we want the mean free path for momentum relaxing collisions to be much longer than the mean free path for momentum conserving collisions. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to argue that in Bailey graphene and the, the relevant regimes of the experiments, both of these inequalities are satisfied. And so we can use either kinetic theory or hydrodynamics to, to understand them. Okay, so I just want to, to dive in with a brief introduction before um, getting into the, the details of Bailey graphene. So to start off um, with- Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Can you go back to the, to the previous slide? Yep. You're saying that you'll be arguing that both inequalities are correct? Yeah. So um, that doesn't one, I mean, that you have both long-lived quasi-particles and a hydrodynamic description? So, so I'm going to argue that we have, um, so this inequality here is essentially telling us that we're in the hydrodynamic regime where momentum is, is almost conserved. Um, and independent of that, I'm also going to argue that we are in this regime where the, um, the mean free path is much longer than this um, sort of thermal wavelength or Fermi wavelength of the, the electrons. Um, Okay, so my confusion, which maybe you can dispel, is that I would say that if, you have, if you're in a regime where you have long-lived quasi-particles, then you have an infinite amount of long-lived quantities, which are your quasi-particle densities. Whilst if you're in the hydrodynamic regime, then somehow you can just keep track of momentum densities, for instance. So you don't have an infinite number of almost conserved quantities in that case. You just have momentum and say energy and that's basically it. So I, I don't I don't quite see how you can both have a description in terms of an infinite set of almost conserved quantities on one hand and just a couple of them on the other hand. Um, I mean, so, so you can always derive um, a hydrodynamic description from from a kinetic theory by just sort of course course screening. Um, so, I mean, I, I can take my 
my Boltzmann equation and take the, the moments of that Boltzmann equation to get the sort of evolution of these um, conserved densities, like the, the momentum density. Um, and in, I mean, I'm throwing away a lot of information when I'm going from this kinetic theory description to the hydrodynamic mm -hmm. description. Right. Um, so, so the, the kinetic theory is, is more, more accurate in that sense. I'm not managing to capture all of that using the hydrodynamic description indeed. So I am throwing away information when I go to this hydrodynamic. Um, but I'm, I'm going to argue that even after throwing away this, this information and just focusing on these conserved densities, we actually managed to get a relatively good description of, of the system. I guess what makes the whole thing work is that you are able to access regimes where your lambda momentum conserving is still very large compared to your thermalization scale, which is which which wouldn't be the case in ordinary metals. Is that also correct to say? Uh, so could you just repeat that? So on the left, your inequality on the left assumes that the momentum conserving mean tree path is much longer than the local equilibration scale. Yeah. Which need not be the case in, in any given metal. No, no. So, so that, yeah, um, that turns out to be true here. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why, why it's, um, it's valid. So here. put differently, you can have a quasi-particle description without having a, an almost conserved momentum. But here, this is not what you're assuming, which is why you can ultimately connect to the hydrodynamic regime from, the kinetic, from kinetic theory. Yes, yes. OK, good. Thanks. OK, so um, yeah, start, let me start with my sort of brief historical overview of, of um, this field of electron hydrodynamics. And so if we start thinking about, um, about transport, then the sort of logical starting point is at the beginning of the, the 20th century with, uh, with Druder theory. That was sort of the first um, accurate description of transport in, in metals. And the way Druder theory works, of course, is by introducing some timescale tau on which momentum is relaxed. And you find that the electrical connectivity is just going to be proportional to this um, timescale tau for, for momentum relaxation. So you already see that in writing down Druder theory, we've assumed that um, the dominant source of scattering are these momentum um, relaxing processes. And you can do the same for um, thermal conductivity as you've done for electrical conductivity. And um, again, you find that the thermal conductivity kappa is proportional to this same time scale tau. Um, and taking the ratio of the thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity, you find the so-called uh, Lorentz number. Um, which is just going to be a bunch of fundamental constants if these equations on the, on the left are correct. Um, and the fact that this Lorentz number is just um, given by this um, fundamental constant here is known as the, the wiedemann franz law. And it has been observed to be um, satisfied in, in most metals and, and fermi liquids. Um, and so this is all still um, kind of on a, on a classical level, um, but to, to bring it up to date with, um, with quantum theory um, required the introduction of, of Fermi liquid theory. And essentially in, in Fermi liquid theory, you can still keep using this, the same formula as in Trude theory. You just need to somewhat reinterpret the, the quantities that enter this formula. In particular, you replace the electron mass by its um, quasi-particle mass and the, this time scale tau by the quasi-particle lifetime. And this gives you that the connectivity is proportional to inverse temperature squared, um, which again is, is satisfied by most Fermi liquids. Um, and so this was sort of the, the state of the art um, in, the, in the 1930s. And it took a while for people to start thinking about um, this different transport regime, which is now known as, as electron hydrodynamics. In fact, people started thinking about this only much later in the, the 1960s. And 
even then it was still just a, a very sort of theoretical concept and um, experiments um, on, on materials were not able to, to access this regime. But it was still interesting to, to think about what would happen if you had an impurity free conductor. Um, so if the impurities aren't causing the, the scattering and we just have electron electron collisions, what are going to be the, the possible signatures? That's one of the questions that, um, that Guji was asking back in 1963. And he came up with a very nice prediction, in fact. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, on your previous slide, you showed uh, that the conductivity is inverse as a temperature to the power of minus two. Yes. Is that due to impurities? Um, no, so, so here in, um, in this theory, you, you can derive this by assuming that momentum galaxization is coming from uh, umklapp scattering, essentially. Um, so, so this would be valid even for extremely clean, um, clean materials. So, so that basically, um, so see, normally when we write this Drude formula, this tau normally comes uh, from disorder. Yes. Now, uh, if you want, if you don't want disorder here, then then on your next slide, right? On your next slide, you start saying about about um, how we're now going to talk about conductivity in systems without disorder. Yes. Right? But if you if you insist on these umclaps, then then you're already without disorder. That that's true. Yes. So so here you you get a finite um, resistivity even. Um, even in the absence of, of disorder, yes. Um, so this is just coming from electron-electron collisions, but momentum galaxing electron-electron collisions. In most of the actual materials, at least at low temperatures, uh, this T-square doesn't work. You get a constant from disorder, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually a big stretch saying that this T-square is seen in most thermoliquids. It actually isn't. Yeah, no, it, it's only, yeah observed in some um, some special cases, that's yeah. true. Um, yeah, you, you need it to be extremely clean for this to, to work because the, um, yeah, umplug scattering is quite weak. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so yes, the, the Gouji effect. So um, this was a nice, um, nice sort of simple prediction for, for what would happen if you had this electron hydrodynamic regime. And the prediction is that the resistivity decreases as a function of temperature in, in this hydrodynamic regime, which when you think about it is, is quite unusual. Typically what you think would happen is if you um, increase the temperature, then you increase the scattering rate. And so you're going to um, increase the resistivity as well. Um, but in fact, there's a simple argument for, for how this works. And um, that's just thinking about um, again, the sort of Trude formula where the um, resistivity is inversely proportional to some momentum relaxing mean free path and thinking about what sets this um, momentum relaxing mean free path um, in the different temperature regimes. So at the very lowest temperatures, um, our electrons are just colliding with the, the walls of this channel along which we're um, conducting current. And so this width of the channel, D, is going to be what sets this length scale for momentum relaxation. And this is just a constant, hence giving us a constant resistivity. Then if we increase the temperature, we start um, getting electron-electron collisions. And momentum relaxation is still happening at collisions with the, the boundary of the channel. However, in between these collisions, the electron is undergoing some random walk um, because of the electron-electron collisions. And this actually means that your mean free path for momentum relaxation is going to increase as you um, increase the temperature because the scandum walk is going to get more and more um, jagged. And this is what causes this, this Gouge effect that the resistivity decreases as a function of temperature. And then eventually, if you crank up temperature enough, you're going to get phonon collisions kicking in and your resistivity starts going up as a function of temperature again. And um, this is this regime here. Okay. 
And so, like I said, this was sort of developed back in the, the 1960s, but not observed for, for many, many years until um, much later in the, in the 1990s, um, auto, auto high mobility Tudex became available. So this is of course the same, uh, same advance that led to, to the observation of the, the quantum Hall effect in, um, in Gagum arsenide. And indeed these auto high mobility Tudex are clean enough that um, this hydrodynamic regime can, can be observed. And so this led to a sort of flurry of experiments back in the, the 1990s. And finally, the sort of latest revival came um, since about 2014 when um, graphene came on the market. And of course, graphene is an extremely, extremely clean material. And so it made sense that this would be an ideal place to see hydrodynamic transport. And one of the first um, experiments that was, that was done to see this hydrodynamic transport in, in graphene was um, do, doing the following thing. So you, you take a, um, a current source and inject some current into, into this graphene and measure the voltage along this horizontal direction. And there are two distinct transport regimes. On the one hand, if we've just got an ordinary conductor, we would expect to get ohmic flow um, where the electrons are just propagating outward from this current source. But in this hydrodynamic regime, we have viscous effects leading to this viscous backflow. So the electrons are going, um, traveling in these electron whirlpools. And what this means is that your electrons are here moving towards the source instead of away from it. And this gives you um, essentially the, the gong sign of the, um, of the resistance, if you calculate the resistance. Um, and this is hence known as this negative non-local resistance. Um, and of course, then the, the most striking observation just came, uh, came last year um, when two independent groups were able to observe the Prosseau flow in graphene channels. So these are again, monolayer graphene samples and um, using two different imaging techniques, um, these groups actually managed to image electron flow as a function of position. And if you take one of these channels and you measure the current perpendicular to this channel, then there's a classic prediction from classical fluid dynamics that um, your velocity profile for the fluid flow is parabolic. This is known as Poisson flow. Um, you find it just by solving the Navier-Stokes equations in this, um, in this geometry. And when they measure this, um, this electron current as a function of position, they did find a um, flow profile that's consistent with the prediction from Poisson flow. So this is really a very visual um, depiction of this hydrodynamic flow. So let me just um, summarize what I've said up to this point. So I've defined electron hydrodynamics to be this transport regime where momentum conserving scattering is the dominant source of scattering. And I've told you about three different um, effects of this, the Gauchy effect, the negative non-local resistance, and finally this um, Poisson flow. And in today's talk, I'm going to be discussing a couple of other possible signatures. So let me dive in by um, talking about this um, kinetic theory formalism um, and the quantum Boltzmann equation. So before I talk about the um, Boltzmann equation, I should say a little bit about the non-interacting problem and the band structure first. So um, for people not familiar with, with bilayer graphene, um, we, we have these two hexagonal lattices stacked on top of each other with this AB stacked form, meaning that an A lattice side of the top layer is on top of a B lattice side of the bottom layer. We can just write down a simple type binding model to find the, the band structure. And what you find are these four parabolic bands. But in fact, we can focus at low enough energies only on the two um, central parabolic bands. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so we've got two quadratic bands which I'm going to label with lambda for the species for electron and hole like bands. And furthermore, we're going to assume that there's some chemical potential that can be tuned by applying a, a gate voltage to the sample. 
And we're going to assume that the chemical potential is close to this um, band touching point. Um, this is a condition that I'm going to refer to as charge neutrality. So the chemical potential is close to this band touching point compared to temperature KBT. And this is the relevant regime for the experiments. And in this regime, we're far away from the, the Fermi liquid regime, meaning that you know, we don't have a Fermi surface, but we have a lot of thermally excited electrons. And so what, what do we do um, with this, this quantum Boltzmann equation? Well, let me just give you a, a sort of very heuristic derivation of, of the, the Boltzmann equation before giving you a few more details. Um, so as I was saying at the beginning, the Boltzmann equation is an equation of motion for this distribution function, f lambda. And if you think about this distribution function at a given momentum and given position, it's going to have two different contributions. It's going to have a contribution coming from ballistic propagation from the earlier time t minus delta t to this later time t. And in this ballistic propagation, we've just propagated from some earlier position and some earlier momentum to this updated momentum and position. But of course, there's a, a second contribution, which is that coming from collisions. Um, and so I'm just going to write this as some generic form delta f due to collisions. And then you just Taylor expand this function for small delta t, rearrange, and you finally end up with this formula here, which is known as the Boltzmann equation, where the quantity on the right-hand side is known as the collision integral. And the collision integral is really um, the, um, the important quantity that needs to be computed depending on what scattering mechanisms you're including. So the different mechanisms we're going to include for, um, for this calculation are on the one hand, electron-electron collisions, of course, because those are expected to be important in the hydrodynamic regime. And then also electron phonon collisions, electron impurity collisions, and so on for momentum relaxation. And for, for the latter sources of scattering, such as electron phonon scattering, we're just going to assume this relaxation time approximation. So this relaxation time approximation just relaxes my distribution function to the Fermi distribution over some time scale tau. Um, and you see that momentum isn't conserved in this, this form of the collision integral. And so essentially, this almost takes us back to, to Trude theory. Um, and so this tau here is going to be the, um, the time scale for, say, electron phonon scattering. Um, so these um, momentum relaxing scattering mechanisms are taken into account like so. But then for the electron electron scattering, we actually do a more detailed calculation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the collision integral later on, but for now, let's assume that we have the Boltzmann equation and go about solving it. Um, so, so how do we do that? Well, we assume that we've got a um, small applied electric field, and then we want to compute the, the response due to that small electric field. So we linearize around this equilibrium distribution, the Fermi distribution, and we expand our distribution function in terms of some set of, of basis functions, um, which I'm calling gn of p, so some, um, some random set of, of polynomials of momentum. And the Boltzmann equation then turns into some equation for these coefficients in the expansion of the distribution function. So the Boltzmann equation ends up becoming a matrix equation, and then we can invert this matrix equation to get the coefficients in terms of the applied electric field, and then from this compute the, the current and hence compute the electrical conductivity. So um, the way we compute the electrical conductivity from the, the distribution function is just by using this formula here, where NF is the number of fermion flavors, which is four for um, bilayer graphene, because we've got four valley, um, sorry, two valleys and two spin degrees of freedom. So this is just the, the number of fermion flavors. And once we've computed this um, electric current J and similarly the thermal current Q, and we relate it to the applied electric field and applied thermal gradient, the transport coefficients are just going to um, be the proportionality constants between the applied fields and the, um, the resulting currents. Okay, so we've got, yes, the electroconductivity, thermal conductivity, and this off-diagonal piece is known as the thermal power. So let me talk a little bit more about the, um, the collision integral and what ingredients go in there. So 
of course, we're going to include coulomb interactions and electron electron scattering. But coulomb interactions preserve momentum as long as we forget about Umklag scattering. Um, and if we work away from charge neutrality at a finite chemical potential, we're going to have to include some way to relax momentum. Otherwise, we get um, essentially an infinite electrical conductivity because there's no way to relax momentum and finite momentum carries finite current. Um, so as soon as we go away from charge neutrality, we need to include some other mechanisms. And we thought of four possibilities. Either we have scattering of impurities, scattering of phonons, scattering of the boundary of the sample, or umklap scattering. And I'm going to neglect the, the last one, umklap scattering, because it um, has a, a large momentum transfer. Um, right? It's momentum transfer by a reciprocal lattice vector. And um, because we're at the, close to this charge neutrality point, this is going to be highly suppressed because of the long range nature of the, the Coulomb interactions. So we just include the first three momentum relaxation mechanisms. So let me first talk about the, the Coulomb scattering um, and how we include that into our collision interval. So there's a way to derive this, this rigorously using the, um, the Keldish formalism. Um, and the starting point is, is known as the, the katanov bime equations, which is some uh, set of equations for the, the Green's function. And you can take these katanov bime equations and derive from it um, this form of the collision integral that, that we're going to use. Um, and this was developed for um, monolayer graphene, in these papers here, and then um, extended to, to monolayer graphene and, um, and also bilayer graphene um, in, in these two papers here, which you recognize, of course, um, as uh, well, one of the, the authors is the organizer of this very seminar. Um, so let me just show you the, the result. I don't want to talk too much about the, the technical details here. Um, so here's the, the form of the collision integral for the um, electron electron scattering. And basically it's got um, a fairly simple form. We're just including this delta function here for energy conservation and um, a bunch of um, Fermi factors here to account for the, the Fermi statistics of the electrons. Um, so to see where these factors come from, we can just look at one of these Feynman diagrams. So we want the initial state here at um, momentum p plus q to be occupied and this initial state at momentum k minus q to be occupied. So these are these two Fermi factors here. And then in order to scatter into these states lambda p and lambda one k, we need these states to be unoccupied. And so we include one minus the Fermi factor for these, um, for these final states. And then, um, so this is the, um, sort of amplitude to scatter into state um, lambda p. And then we subtract off the amplitude for scattering out of the state lambda p, which is this corresponding diagram over here. And these matrix elements here are just um, essentially computed from these, from these diagrams. Um, and you can also think about deriving this collision integral in a more simple way just by applying uh, Fermi's golden rule to this problem. Okay. And so just to um, say a little bit more about um, sort of the, the physics of this, this collision integral. So of course we use the, the Coulomb interaction, but we need to include screening because um, bilayer caffeine has a finite density of state at charge neutrality. So we've got this Thomas Fermi screening. And in fact, when you compute the Thomas Fermi screening for, sorry, it's a question? No, okay. So when you compute the Thomas Fermi screening, it's going to be proportional to this fine structure constant alpha, which in fact cancels out between the, the numerator and denominator. And this means that um, our final result for the electron electron scattering rate by dimension analysis can only depend on temperature. There's no other scale in the problem that it could depend on. So it's going to be some dimensionless constant C times temperature. And this sort of form of the scattering rate is also known as Planckian dissipation because it essentially just 
um, depends on temperature and Planck's constant. And the only remaining question is, what is this constant C? And um, there's actually a simple argument for what this constant C is as well. Um, and this is going to be related to um, the th thing I was saying at the very beginning about the validity of our um, kinetic theory formalism. Um, so remember, I was saying that for um, kinetic theory to be valid, we need the mean free path to be much longer than this thermal wavelength. Um, so the thermal wavelength is just going to be um, h bar divided by this typical momentum of my electrons. And the um, thermal, the sorry, the mean free path is just going to be the thermal velocity times this electron electron scattering time, which is given by um, kBT over h bar times this dimensionless constant c. This dimensionless constant c um, turns out to be proportional to one over nf, the number of fermion flavors, and um, is small because nf is large. Well, nf is four, but we can think of four as a sort of fairly large number. Um, and so if we compute the ratio of the thermal wavelength to this mean free path, we find precisely this constant c, which is one over nf, which is much smaller than one. So basically the thing that justifies this whole um, kinetic theory um, description of the problem is that nf is large, the number of fermion flavors is large. Okay, so let me just briefly talk about the other scattering mechanisms that, um, that we include. So as I said before, we've got impurities, the scattering of the boundary and the phonons. So impurity scattering rate is just going to be a constant. It's the impurity density times the matrix element for the scattering times the density of states, which is just the, the mass. The scattering of the boundary is just going to be your, um, well, the scattering rate is just going to be your typical velocity divided by this length scale of the sample. So this scales like square root of temperature. And finally, the um, electron phonon scattering rate is going to be proportional to temperature um, and takes the following form where D is known as the deformation potential, which essentially tells you how strongly the phonons couple to the electrons. Um, Rho is the um, density, the mass density of caffeine, and C is just the speed of sound. And so this phonon scattering rate um, is scaling with temperature in the same way as the, the electron, scattering, electron, electron scattering rate is also um, scaling with temperature. Okay, so this was, um, was all the sort of ingredients that we needed to do our kinetic theory. And before I show you the, the results, uh, the numerical results coming from the kinetic theory, I want to first discuss um, a little bit more of the intuition um, behind this. And to do this, introduce my hydrodynamic description, um, which is this two fluid model that I mentioned before. And as I said, you can derive hydrodynamics from kinetic theory just by taking moments of the Boltzmann equation. So if you just essentially multiply the Boltzmann equation by momentum, integrate over momentum, um, then you get an evolution equation for the momentum density. Um, and this is what I'm, I'm calling um, u, u lambda, um, which is essentially the, the mean velocity of the electrons of species lambda. And when you do this, when you carry out this um, derivation of the fluid equations from the Boltzmann equation, you end up with these two coupled equations. And so I've got my mean electron velocity UE and my mean whole velocity UH, and they're coupled via this Coulomb drag term. So if my electrons and holes are moving at different velocities, they'll exert drag on each other. So this is some viscous drag um, coming from the electrons and the holes exchanging momentum. And this is going to happen on this fast time scale for electron electron collisions. Then I've just got my momentum relaxing term, which just looks like a Druder like term. Um, and then, of course, the, the driving terms coming from the applied electric field and thermal gradient. And I can solve these equations and compute from them um, quantities like the electrical current, J, just by um, using formulas like this. 
and then use this to derive the um, electrical connectivity. And so we can make some, some interesting predictions just based on looking at this two fluid model. And the first thing I want to, to think about is um, transport when the chemical potential is set to zero, we're at precisely this charge neutrality point. In this case, we have two, two different transport modes. The first one is where electrons and holes are moving at the same velocity in the same direction. And this mode, of course, has a, has a finite momentum associated with it. And since momentum is, um, is almost conserved, it's only relaxed on a slow time scale, this finite momentum mode is going to be long lived. It's going to be relaxed on a slow time scale tau mr. And this finite momentum mode contributes to the thermal connectivity. It carries some, some heat cone with it, but it doesn't carry any charge because we've got oppositely charged particles traveling uh, at the same velocity and with the same number density because we're at charge neutrality. On the other hand, if we've got electrons and holes moving in opposite directions, um, then this will carry some finite charge current, but zero heat current. And this will, of course, be relaxed on a much faster time scale, the time scale for electron electron collisions, just because um, there's no momentum associated with it. So there's no reason that it should be long lived. And so, because um, heat and electric charge are transported by these different mechanisms, the connectivities are going to be set by these different time scales. Electrical connectivity will be proportional to the momentum conserving time scale, thermal connectivity will be proportional to the momentum relaxing time scale. So when we take the ratio of them to compute the Lorentz number, we find something that is much larger than predicted by the wiedemann franz law. Um, so we find this wiedemann franz law violation. And indeed, this is what we observe in, in our quantum Boltzmann numerics. So on the left, I'm plotting some numerical results by solving the, the Boltzmann equation. Um, and you see that as um, our intuition told us, we've got a violation of the Wiener and Franz law, which is largest at charge neutrality. Um, and the, the amount of, of violation of the Wiener and Franz law is given by essentially this ratio of the, the time scales and tells us how hydrodynamic we are. Um, and on the right, I'm plotting some um, experiments that were done on, on monolayer caffeine. So, um, this is, of course, a different material, so we shouldn't compare the left and the right um, quantitatively, but at least um, qualitatively, the, the same physics holds here. And um, the, the blue data is coming from um, the, the cleanest sample, which is the most hydrodynamic, um, which agrees again with our intuition. And next, let's think about um, transported finite chemical potential. So now things have changed slightly. We've increase the chemical potential, we've got more electrons than holes. And so now both the finite momentum and the zero momentum mode carry both heat and charge. And so this will mean that um, at finite chemical potential, the electrical connectivity is also set by this, um, this long time scale tau MR, right? So at finite chemical potential, my finite momentum mode starts carrying charge and because it's long lived, it will contribute a lot to the electrical connectivity. And so in particular, if we compute the ratio of the electrical connectivity at some finite chemical potential to the electrical connectivity at zero chemical potential, we find this ratio of time scales, which is again, much larger than one. Um, and just to make this a little bit more um, quantitative from the two fluid model, you can derive this, this following formula. So the Electrical connectivity has this sort of druder like form of electron, um, electron charge squared times density divided by mass times some time scale. But there's two different time scales appearing. Um, this momentum conserving time scale, which is coming from this um, zero momentum mode, and then the momentum relaxing time scale, which is the contribution from the finite momentum mode. Um, but this contribution from the finite momentum mode only kicks in when there's some imbalance in charge of. Um, in the number densities of electrons and holes. Um, and so if we just expand for small chemical potential, we can derive the, the following formula, which is essentially telling us that the um, electrical conductivity as a function of chemical potential is got this parabolic shape where the, um, the sort of um, slope of the parabola 
is telling us something about the ratio of these um, timescales. And so this um, fits nicely with the experimental data that I'm showing here. So this is from the suspended bilayer samples of the, um, the group in Geneva. And they've measured um, the electrical conductivity as a function of chemical potential divided by the electrical conductivity at charge neutrality. They find, as predicted by our model, this parabolic shape of the, um, of the conductivity. And in particular, by um, looking at um, the, the curvature of this parabola, we can extract that the momentum relaxing timescale is about three times as large as the momentum conserving timescale, which places us well within this hydrodynamic regime. Um, and I'm just um, showing um, two, two theoretical curves to compare to this experimental data. So the solid line is the kinetic theory, Boltzmann formalism. The dashed line is the um, hydrodynamic to fluid model description. And you see that both of them agree, um, agree pretty well with the, um, with the data. Um, and this is nice because it tells us that this two fluid model, which of course is much simpler than the kinetic theory, is going to be, um, is going to be a good description, um, even though it sort of loses a lot of information compared to the, the kinetic theory formalism. The other thing that is noteworthy about these, um, about these experiments is that we have the scaling collapse happening. So what they've measured here is electrical conductivity as a function of number density and temperature. Um, so these are the, the different temperatures listed here. And then they've decided to plot it in terms of these, uh, in terms of this dimensionless quantity beta mu. And they find that the curves for different temperatures all collapse onto one parabola. And the scaling collapse is actually non-trivial. Um, fundamentally, we, we don't really have any reason to believe that would have to be the case. We could have different curves for, for different temperatures. So there's something non-trivial going on here. And in fact, there's, there's two possible explanations for, for why we get the scaling collapse. So the first um, explanation for this temperature collapse that, um, that we put forward is that we have um, electron phonon collisions being a dominant source of momentum relaxation in these experiments. So remember this, this formula here that the slope or the, the curvature of the parabola is proportional to um, the ratio of time scales tau, uh, tau mc and tau mr. And the fact that all the curves for different temperatures collapse tells us that this um, curvature of the parabola is independent of temperature, meaning that both of these time scales need to scale the same way with temperature. And if you think back about what I was saying when I did the um, quantum Boltzmann formalism, well, the um, electron electron scattering rate is proportional to temperature, and the electron phonon scattering rate is proportional to temperature. So if we take the ratio of these two uh, time scales, then we indeed find something independent of temperature consistent with this um, scaling collapse. Um, but there's a, a second possible explanation for this um, the scaling collapse, um, which actually assumes that not phonons, but impurities are responsible for momentum relaxation. But to make this work out, you need to, you need to work a bit harder because naively based on the um, scaling I was showing you before, if you assume that impurities are responsible for momentum relaxation, well, the impurity scattering rate is independent of temperature. And so, um, this would not give us a temperature independent curvature of the parabola. So you need to, to do a bit more work. You need to assume two further ingredients. Firstly, that um, bilayer graphene has an interaction induced gap. So the band structure, the non-interacting band structure that I showed you was just a gapless um, band structure. But um, there's some theoretical evidence that um, using, using Hartley-Fock or RG calculations, that there's an interaction induced gap um, which let's call delta. And so you need to modify the, the band structure that you use. But furthermore, we need to include um, charge puddles, um, which you can think of as electron and hole puddles coming from chemical potential fluctuations as a function of position. So the chemical potential is not uniform as a function of position. It's got some fluctuations on some scale phi. And adding these two ingredients to the model 
actually um, gives you a um, impurity scattering rate that um, scales in such a way that the, um, the um, scaling collapse is, is the same way as observed in the experiment. So basically, we've got these two different alternative explanations. And um, so far, um, I think both are, both are kind of interesting proposals. And there's more sort of work needed to, to understand which of them is, is the right one. Um, I just want to, to mention at the very end that we extended our work to multi-layer graphene. Um, so instead of just looking at bilayer graphene, you can look at stacking four, six, eight layers, and so on. Um, and of course, the starting point is the same. You just start with the type binding model, derive its band structure, and then do some kinetic theory um, for electrons in that band structure. And in fact, we find that these multi-layers are quite similar to, um, to bilayer graphene in some sense. So of course, we've got more, um, more bands because we've got more layers. Um, and that increases the number of, um, of fermions. Uh, in particular, with n layers, we've got n species of fermions with different masses. Um, but in fact, only certain um, fermion flavors are coupled by these um, electron electron interactions. So if you compute the matrix element, in fact, only the um, species with label R and n plus one minus R are connected. And what this leads to at the end of the day is that the electron electron scattering rate is inversely proportional to um, one over n, the number of layers. And the electron phonon scattering rate is also proportional to one over n, the number of layers. And so if we assume that um, electron phonon interactions are sort of what limits our hydrodynamic regime, then this would tell us that um, because they both scale the same way with n, multi-layer graphene is as hydrodynamic as, um, as bilayer graphene. Um, or in other words, the hydrodynamic window is, is similar for these different materials. Um, and you can play the, the same game as, as before. You can write down a um, fluid model um, for now n coupled fluids instead of two coupled fluids. Um, and indeed, we find that this um, multi-fluid model is also an, an accurate description of, um, of multi-layer graphene. So let me um, summarize what I've said. So I've argued that um, the experiments on suspended bilayer graphene um, have shown that it exhibits hydrodynamic electron transport. Um, there's, there's two signatures that I, I mentioned. The first one is that the um, electrical connectivity is increasing sharply when you go away from charge neutrality because the momentum mode starts carrying um, charge. And the other one is this violation of the, the wiedemann franz law at charge neutrality. And so this shows us that we've got a, a separation of scales. So the electron electron scattering is, um, is dominating over the um, momentum conserving, uh, momentum galaxing scattering. And furthermore, if we assume that the scaling collapse is coming from the, um, from the phonons providing the momentum relaxation, then this would tell us that the phonon scattering rate is much larger than impurity and, and boundary scattering. And I showed you that um, in our numerical results, the quantum Boltzmann equation yields results that are well approximated by this much simpler hydrodynamic to fluid model, um, which, which is much, um, yeah, much easier to deal with than doing this complicated kinetic theory and gives us a nice intuition for, for what's going on. Um, so thank you for, for your attention. Um, does anyone have any, any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Ken, um, for this very nice talk. Uh, are there questions? Um, I have sort of a general question, uh, this is Subir. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, just about the last sentence here. Uh, of the relationship between QBE and the two-fluid model. I mean, is there some clear-cut limit in which this mapping is exact? Just So, okay, so one way to think about this two-fluid model is as a two, two-mode approximation to this, um, this quantum Boltzmann equation. So when I was talking about solving this, um, this quantum Boltzmann equation, 
I said that we, um, we expand this distribution function in terms of some set of, of basis functions and then turn this into some matrix equation for these coefficients. And in fact, this two fluid model is basically solving the Boltzmann equation with only two basis functions corresponding to this um, finite momentum mode and zero momentum mode. Um, and so the, the fact that this two fluid model approximates the quantum Boltzmann equation tells us that at least for charged transport, um, these two modes are basically the, the sort of dominant response you get when you apply an electric field. Uh, we also find that if you apply a um, thermal gradient and compute the thermal conductivity, this no longer holds because there's some further modes coming in. And, um, and so you need, yeah, you need more than just the two modes to, to account for thermal transport. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe, I mean, I, I wanted to connect to that question also again uh, with, the, with the, two fluid, the two fluid model. So I was wondering, it's not quite obvious to me, you have this form where you just have one tau momentum conserving, one tau momentum relaxing. Sorry for the noise in the background. Um, is, it, is there any condition on, this, uh, yeah, here, like, no, you just went past it. You were, there was an expression for sigma. Ah, yes. Yes, yeah. this one. Is there any further uh, condition in this formula? Because it's not totally obvious to me that it's just one plus the other. Yes, so to derive this formula, you need to assume that the, um, momentum conserving scattering rate is much larger than the momentum relaxing scattering rate. Um, so yeah, this is this formula is only valid in the, the hydrodynamic regime already, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there further questions? Oh yeah, I see um, two questions. Maybe Maxime first. Yeah, um, uh, uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, just a small question. So can I think of this uh, hole and, uh, and the electron uh, the velocity as a separate, it's conserving separately in some way so that you have this projection on the two modes that is the charge carrying and the heat uh, carrying modes. So basically there are sums and the difference, right? So, so, but, so this projection into the, just these two modes uh, means that there is some kind of extra conservation law here. Uh, does it assume just that you have a uh, neglecting you neglecting the uh, possibility of uh, electron hole annihilation or, or may maybe it's or it just uh, trying to understand what are the assumption when how to understand when this works well um okay so yeah so the fluid equations are here um so so yeah, we, we've got this, um, this Coulomb track term, which is um, sort of this um, e exchanging momentum between the, the electrons and holes, um, UE and UH. Um, and the, um, if you sort of take um, number density of electrons times this equation plus number density of holes times this equation, this, um, this Coulomb track term cancels. So this Coulomb track term is conserving total momentum of electrons plus holes. Um, so that's this um, sort of additional conservation law that um, the, um, yeah, tells us that the momentum mode is not going to be relaxed by these electron hole collisions. Um, and with the, the other thing you, you mentioned about the, um, the electron hole annihilation. So um, when, when we derive this, this two fluid model, we're just taking the, the first moment of the, um, of the Boltzmann equation. So we're just looking at the evolution of, of momentum. Um, and so we're not looking at um, the sort of evolution of, of number density, which um, I guess would, would be um, taking into account this sort of annihilation of, of electrons and holes going on. Um, so, yeah. So, so basically it happens in the other channels that is, you just decide not to look at because you don't need it basically, right? Yes, yeah, so, so we just focus on, on the sort of first moment of the Boltzmann equation, but of course you've got um, all these higher mm -hmm. moments mm -hmm. as well. And 
again, th th this goes back to sort of this um, the sort of two mode approximation that we, we're making here. So we, we're really um, just including these two momentum modes, which turn out to be um, relevant for charge transport. But um, in, in general, yeah, you, you'd have um, you know, a bunch of, of other higher moments as well. And yeah. Thank you. Okay. Then there's Tim. Uh, hi. Um, I only have a very basic question about the Gurshi effect. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I'm not, it's not clear to me. Um, where does the momentum go, so to say? So maybe you can go back to the slide uh, where you explained it. Then I can. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, so if you look at the middle uh, picture, then what's shown is the electron will turn around. So, so and I, as I understood you, it will scatter from another electron. So yes. in this way, it does not reach the, the boundary. That's why it's, um, yeah, it's not, uh, how to say, its momentum is not uh, changed that much by the boundary. However, the electron which it scatters from will then move into the direction of the boundary. So, so I'm wondering that there is an effect at all. Can you maybe explain? Okay, so, so you're referring to the sort of middle, middle figure here. Right. And so, so each of these scattering processes here is basically two electrons colliding with each other and they're exchanging momentum. Mm -hmm. um, but the total momentum of the electrons is still conserved in each of these scattering processes. Um, the, the point is that the only place that momentum is actually lost is at the this boundary of the channel. So every time the electrons collide with the boundary, they can transfer some momentum. So only this is where momentum relaxation happens. And this is why um, this momentum relaxing length scale is really this length scale between collisions with the boundary, which happens via some, some Gandam walk, which is mediated by these electron electron collisions. Uh, I understand. I think I understand this argument if you consider a single electron as you as you show in the figure but this electron wouldn't it increase the scattering of other electrons at the boundary because it changed the momentum of other electrons let's say in the first uh, in the first scattering process yeah of course it goes away from the boundary without hitting the boundary but it will drive another electron towards the boundary wouldn't it do that uh yes yes and in, in principle um Okay. Um, but... So, so are you saying that this is a way that electron electron collisions are contributing to some momentum relaxation because they're scattering electrons towards the boundary? Is that right? Uh, that, that's uh, basically, I'm wondering if the transversal momentum, it should also be conserved, right? Except at the boundary. So, and if it, the transversal momentum is conserved, I would expect that just instead of moving like this and this, uh, it's transferring its momentum to another electron and in this way, uh, indirectly hitting the boundary, so to say, why are the other electron? Uh, basically, I want to understand why, why this argument I'm making is too naive. Um, let's see, so, I mean, really, I'm just um, just considering electrons um, scattering scattering off each other while um, conserving their, their total momentum, and then um, it's when they, they collide with the boundary that this momentum is is lost, and so this um, gives me this sort of momentum relaxing time scale, um, but. You, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I guess I'm not quite sure if I follow your your argument. Maybe you can can rephrase it. So let's say instead of considering an electron which is starting in the middle of the system, you consider one which is very close to the boundary. Mm -hmm. In the ballistic case, it would just move away until it hits the other boundary. And yep. um, then it's reflected from the other boundary. However, in the hydrodynamic transport in, in the middle figure, an electron starting at the boundary would 
almost immediately hit another electron being reflected, maybe being reflected back to the boundary. So there are some electrons which hit I the see. boundary much more often, at okay. least in my naive uh, imagination. But, but then, so I suppose what, what would happen is that, you know, each time you collide with, with an electron, you've got a sort of equal probability of being scattered towards a boundary or away from a boundary. And so probably these, these two factors cancel out at the end of the day. It's going to be some sort of geometric factor, I suppose, that should average out to zero when you, when you average over all the, the collisions. Okay, so I would really have to do the detailed calculation to see. I, I, I suspect, you, yeah, you'd, you'd write down some sort of um, geometric factor for these, you know, for the phase space density of all these different scattering processes and then have to average over all the scattering angles and then um, hopefully that effect would, okay. would cancel out, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, are there further questions? I don't see any hands right now. So yeah, if not, then uh, let's uh, thank Lynn again. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, in two weeks, there'll be the next seminar and it will be given by Aaron Hui. And uh, yeah, hope to see many of you. <laughs>